Hello, this is Brent Backus, Director of Employee Engagement and co-host of Deloitte's Who We Are podcast series. Our people experience our culture and live our core values in very different ways. The Who We Are podcast bring their stories to life, celebrating our culture of courage and giving our listeners the opportunity to hear about their experiences through their eyes. Who We Are stories can be complex, courage in the face of tragedy and natural disaster, or simple, like what someone is passionate about doing at work or something extraordinary that they've done outside of Deloitte. Typically, our chief talent officer, Mike Preston, is my co-host, but we're switching it up a little bit today. Mike is retiring at the end of May and has agreed to sit on the hot seat and let me interview him about his career at Deloitte, his legacy as our chief talent officer, and what shaped him as a leader. All right, so Mike, retiring at the end of May as our chief talent officer, 40 years in professional services, 17 with Deloitte. You've held a number of different leadership positions in our tax practice, leading the NORPAC region, most recently serving as our firm's chief talent officer. Most important question to start with is, what are you going to do when you retire? Wow. Yeah, it's here. It goes by fast, 40 years in a blink of an eye. You know, I'm not going to work. That's one thing. <laughs> I've, I've decided, I've talked to my wife, I'm going to enjoy myself. I, I'm going to play some golf, and I know you and I have golfed together at times, so be careful next time. Hopefully my index will be a little lower. I plan to spend some time in Dallas, where I live now, and in Florida, where we have a vacation home that we're remodeling. I've got grandkids and kids in California. So I'm not worried about finding things to do. Yeah, I think no, no shortage of busyness ahead in the future for you. So Mike, I know you're going into retirement. Before I let you go there, I want let's do a little bit of a look back. So your role as chief talent officer the last four years, lots of accomplishments from a broader talent channel perspective. What's going to be the thing that you look back on and are most proud of? Yeah, that's a good question, Brent, and I've been asked it before. And when I reflect on the last four years, I really came into the role at a great time. We'd just gone through some structural changes within talent, and I got to focus on this notion of engagement, creating an engaged workforce, what we stand for. And when I look at the pieces of that, I think we've probably moved the meter the most on well-being. I think about this idea that work and high performance doesn't have to be mutually exclusive from a culture around well-being. So that's probably the number one thing. Although right there with it is the 16-week family leave program. Yeah. And, and probably that's the thing that stands out most within Deloitte and maybe even externally is the movements we've made to help men and women with family leave. That's good. And, you know, the, the, the paid family leave is that interesting intersection around well-being and another topic I know you're passionate about ar around inclusion. Talk a little bit about the, the movement that you've seen and what was kind of the impetus behind where we wanted to go from an inclusion standpoint with the inclusion councils, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. Because the family leave program recognized that the family dynamic is different. So men and women, different structures within the family we all wanted to think about. We made a move that I think was bold and innovative, and that was to consider inclusion councils as a construct for how we operationalize the, the inclusion framework. Diversity and inclusion has always been tied together. Diversity is about demographics in my mind, and inclusion is about authenticity and having this ability to connect and, and grow and belong to an organization. So we made some bold moves, and we got criticized for it, frankly, at first, as if we were doing something that was outside the norm. But I think hindsight has suggested that creating this bridging capital between ERGs and the different groups, BRGs as we call them, really helped propel us to a new, new position within inclusion. Yeah. You've talked a little bit about some of the programmatic things we've done, the paid family leave, the inclusion councils. You also talked about well-being as being something very personal to you. You know, I think you've done a lot in terms of shifting the mindsets of our leaders, not just from a programmatic standpoint, but from a behavioral right. standpoint right. to really help from a broader firm standpoint, we recognize how important this is. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like and trying to shift that mindset toward well-being? It wasn't always easy, for sure. There's some long-held beliefs around how people need to work and What's important is to be at the office and getting on planes and always traveling. And we're starting to make people realize that we can be just as high performing and allow for well-being. So the leaders have accepted that. They need to walk the talk more. They need to set examples more. The teams need to do it. And I think it's becoming more accepted about how we work. At a personal level, I've always believed that a work hard, play hard culture was doable. And in fact, I did it even in my early career. Yeah. I used to have to sneak out to play basketball at 6 p.m. on a Tuesday night 
because everybody expected you to be working during tax season. Now we embrace it. We say, go play basketball, just come back, get online, get your work done. So the idea that you can do both, I think is really refreshing. And I think our leaders are starting to come around to that. Great. From a talent strategy perspective, you often talk about the importance of um, developing a leadership culture focused on the development and well-being of all of our people, right? Let's talk about the development aspect of that just a little bit. When you think about development, you know, you talk often about continuous development. What does continuous development mean to you? Right, particularly in this um, fourth industrial revolution context around continuous learning, it's really, really important. When I frame our talent strategy, as you just described it, I really think of us as a learning organization. We develop leaders. It's all about development. Yes, we have client work and yes, we make money, but the whole importance of our focus is to develop leaders. So you need to be a continuous learner. I've always been curious. That curiosity, I think, has served me well. I mean, I went from a tax partner to running talent. A lot of that was due to the fact that I was interested in people and interested in kind of making a culture that would be consistent with my values. And yeah. I, I really feel like we've been successful in doing that over the last four years. It, it's interesting because here you are, a seasoned professional, deep-rooted in tax, who's asked to then become a chief talent officer and lead from a people perspective, which says a lot about your personal brand. Can you talk a little bit about what you, I know this is the part you're not comfortable with, don't like talking <laughs> about yourself, yeah. but when you think about your personal brand, what, what, what is it that you want people to think about? I think it's a super important concept, and if I could leave a message to anyone who's listening about developing your own personal brand, I think it's very, very important. I think it becomes the compass about how you make decisions, how you frame things you have to choose from. For me, it's about the experiences and the people that developed me throughout my life. One of the early stories I often tell is playing basketball in high school and coming home and being proud that I scored 20 points or that I had a good game. And my dad would look me in the eye and say, well, did you win? It's not about you, Mike. It's about the team, yeah. the team success. So I quickly got this team over individual belief as a core value. And I, I, I do that to this day. I get irritated, frankly, if someone says it's all about them and their accomplishments. Yeah. I want them to be for the team. So there's one quick example. My mom had this look that she would give me that would melt you if you weren't doing the right thing, yeah. quote unquote. So I, I've lived that integrity value pretty strongly based on, on that look from my mother over the years. You know, are the things that I'm doing things that I would be proud of with the heavy light shined on them yeah. on, on the Wall Street Journal front page? So that's really important. And then finally, the, the work hard, play hard mentality that we've talked about before. And I, I've had that throughout my life because I've been given lots of talks by people about life is short. Try to make sure you're living the life you want to live. Yeah, very, very good. You talk about the importance of teaming and you had a couple of great family examples there. You know, I think a lot of times we say what doesn't kill us makes us stronger and how a leader uh, operates in those times of struggle is uh, oftentimes telling. You live through the Accenture transition and what have you. Lessons learned coming out of that that brought you and made you the leader that you are today? Yeah, that's really a good point because probably the best leadership experience I got was the worst personal professional experience, and that was Enron. I was an Anderson partner, and in 2001, I was in charge of the San Francisco tax practice for Anderson. And three months after I'd been named to that leadership role, Enron hit. My job quickly turned from running a practice, which I thought I knew how to do, to trying to find a home for 25 partners and 250 people. And yeah. that was challenging. But you know what? That door closes, you open it, you walk through it, and you start leading. I had experiences every day where I met with leaders of other firms. I'd come back to the office at 8 a.m. every morning. I did a town hall every morning. It wasn't a town hall in an auditorium. It was in the lobby of our office where everybody would walk around and we'd talk. What happened yesterday? Where are we going to go tomorrow? So I do think that things that challenge you yeah. make you better. Yeah. And I've often said, if you want to grow, make yourself uncomfortable. I wouldn't have chosen this particular experience, but I think I grew from it. Very, very good. So Mike, a, a big part of development, which I know you're very passionate around, is this notion of mentorship. And you, you talk a lot about the importance of being good mentors to those that are up and coming in the firm. Can you talk a little bit about, when you think back on your career, who have been those mentors that you've looked up to and what is it that they brought to the table for you? When I think about that, there's really two people that come to mind. One was a partner at Anderson in the early days and he was the one that really reinforced that you can have a personal life and a work life and be successful at both for me. This guy played on community softball teams, he had a big family, he was always poised 
And I looked at him as somebody that I aspired to be like if I were to make partner in an accounting firm at Anderson at the time. So that's one. The second one is a Deloitte partner by the name of Jim Orr, who ran operations for tax under Chet Wood. And it was under Jim Orr's leadership that he created the talent officer role within tax and asked me to do it. I always appreciated Jim's integrity. I thought it was impeccable. He was impeccable with his word, as they like to say, which is one of the four agreements, which is a book I like. But I would pick Jim Orr uh, and a partner that I worked with at Anderson is probably two people that were highly influential and mentored me. That's great. Just a few more questions for you here, Mike. Let's talk about, as we think about what's to come. You know, there's a lot of talk about the workforce of the future, different dynamics of, of the workforce. What advice would you have for those who are coming into the workforce today in terms of what they should be thinking about or what skills they should be thinking about that might be different than how you and I grew up in the firm? Right. When we came into the profession, it was a degree-based hiring sort of paradigm. I think people today for sure have to be continuous learners, and we talked about that. But focus on some of your core skills. It's not that you have a degree in X or Y, accounting, strategy, technology, whatever. It's that you have this core base of cognitive skills and emotional traits that will allow you to be successful in the future. Be curious. Be agile. I read a lot. One of my well-being hacks also is a professional hack for me. Is I do not connect when I fly, and I flew 160,000 miles last year. I read. I read articles. I read books. I feel like I grow outside my lane when I do that. I, that can be conversational on things. I can be agile. I think the notion of agility is probably the most important characteristic for the people in the future. Very, very good. And so that's advice for the incoming generation of the workforce. What advice would you have for the rest of us talent professionals that are going to be here while you're out on the golf course? Don't forget the mission. We're a leadership culture focused on the development and well-being of all of our people. I think if you stay focused on that, what our true values are around developing leaders, you can't go wrong. You'll create high engagement. You've led our engagement team, and we've got the highest engagement scores we've had in a long time, in fact, ever. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think that's the holy grail. An engaged workforce will take the hill for you. They'll be brand ambassadors. Don't lose sight of the goal. Excellent. Well said. Thank you so much, Mike. And, you know, on behalf of the Talent Channel, on behalf of the firm, on behalf of our leaders, just thank you for all that you've done and for all that you've brought to the table. I certainly know that you've been a tremendous influence on me and many of our colleagues. And while we'll miss you, I know that you will be putting well and working on the chipping game. And we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Brent. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening today. And remember to subscribe to the Who We Are podcast. You can find us on Deloitte.com, the Deloitte podcasting app, iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to send us your thoughts, suggestions, and story ideas for future podcasts by emailing us at ustalent at Deloitte.com. <laughs>